So you might ask now, what is the point of these nine rules of inference? Well, the whole point is, is if we're encountering arguments such as linguistic arguments that we come across our, uh, in our everyday lives, the whole point of the nine rules of inference is to help us prove those arguments' validity. Um, just as we took Venn diagrams before with categorical syllogisms, we can take the nine rules of inference and actually use those to prove validity for argument types that are not categorical. So if you have an argument that contains if-then statements or they contain either-or statements, those are the ones that we would actually need to do a formal deductive proof with. And that's what we use these nine rules of inference for. And again, these are only the nine basic rules. There are tons of other rules that have been derived, you know, since the first nine were, were, were discovered. Um, but we're only going to concentrate on these first nine for this introductory course. And um, if we look at these formal deductive proofs, um, we'll try to stick with something simple just so you get the basic idea. And from that point on, we'll look towards uh, more complex ones. All right, so let's say we have an argument that looks something like this. If either algebra is required or geometry is required, then all students will study mathematics. Algebra is required and trigonometry is required. Therefore, all students will study mathematics. You know, from an outward appearance, this is a fairly simple argument. It's not something you would have to spend a whole lot of time figuring out whether it's actually valid or invalid, whether it's something that we can accept. Um, however, you know, arguments can be much more complex than this. But what we're going to do is we're going to take this simple argument and deconstruct it with a formal deductive proof to actually show that this actually will work and is valid and structured. Before we start any sort of argument, what we do is we define the terms. We always do this at the beginning. Just as we did in our categorical syllogism, we're going to use some variable names to represent our terms and our argument. So we'll start off with our first term, algebra we'll represent with the letter A. We'll use G for a second term, geometry. We'll use S for our third term, that uh, all students will study mathematics. And for our fourth term, we'll use T for trigonometry being required. So these are the four terms in our argument. You can see how this doesn't actually work for our Venn diagrams because we have more than three terms. Um, and so this is why we resort to you know, our uh, original nine deductive uh, proof uh, rule. So what we're going to do is we're going to break down each statement into a symbolic representation. So we'll start off with first statement. If algebra is required, or geometry is required, then all students will study mathematics. So here's what it's going to look like. We'll start off with our first term. We'll, we'll leave a number of lines. That's a good practice. So our first term, our first statement, A, right, or algebra, or geometry, G, is required. This will actually lead Right, that's our then statement right, that you see right here. Then all students will study mathematics. And so that was our term S, as we see right here. All right. So that's our first statement. Our second statement states that algebra is required and trigonometry is required. And so we have our two terms, A, and we have T. And this leads us to our conclusion. Therefore, all students will study mathematics. So therefore, S. And so that's basically how we represent our argument. All right, so this entire argument that you see here breaks down into this thing. And you can tell, even just by our translation, that 
This is a much simpler form to actually look at to do our deductive proof with. The whole point of symbolic logic, the whole point of doing formal deductive proofs is to try and strip down the language, all this unnecessary stuff that we will sometimes get confused with. Right? And that's kind of the, the tricky part about language. Language is always obscure. Right? Language is always something, if you're especially a stylistic writer, one that can sometimes mislead you. Right? You can be misled. Um, it sometimes obscures the truth. And so by breaking a complex linguistic argument down into a symbolic form, we oftentimes strip away enough of the language that we can look at this a little bit more clearly. So moving on from this is where we go into our formal deductive proof. So this is the translation, all right? So from the argument to a symbolic form is our translation. All right. And our actual proof starts on the next one. All right, so here's how the proof goes. We'll go down to our next line, line three. All right, this is where we use our nine basic rules of inference. All right, to start breaking this down to try and get from our premises back down to the conclusion. So the goal here, and the goal in all the stuff that I'm about to show you, is to try and manipulate the premises in such a way that I will get this result in the end. So if somewhere down through my proof, you know, I go through lines three, four, five, and etc., and I'm manipulating using my nine rules of inference, if I come across this term that pops up by itself here, S, it means that I've actually got a valid proof. Right? So the whole point is to get S out of our manipulations of the premises. So here's how we do this. Let's start off with line two. What we're going to do is we're going to use one of our nine basic rules of inference. All right, so let me switch pens here. All right. Here's the first thing that I get. A. Well, where does this come from? This comes from, actually, let me draw a clearer line here. All right, so sometimes what you want to do in a ductive proof is you want to mark down exactly what the operations are. It's kind of like when you do a mathematical derivation. Um, so from your math classes, you probably remember as you're going line by line doing a, you know, an algebraic proof, what you do is off to the side if you mark down the operations that you're performing. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing. We're going to mark down and we're going to keep track of what our operations are. So how do I get from this set of premises to this next line, A? Well, to get A, what I did was I took line 2 and I did some simplification. All right. So the simplification on line 2, remember the nine rules of inference that we had? Here, I'll show you back here. All right. Uh, simplification said that if I had P and Q, if I had P and Q, that meant that I actually had P. It also meant if I had P and Q, that I would have Q. All right, so the, the conjunction of both of these terms means that I can actually take one of these terms out. All right, the idea, again, that if you have a collection of P and Q, well, obviously you had P, otherwise you don't have a collection of P and Q. Or same thing over here. If I have P and Q as a collection of stuff, I obviously have Q, otherwise I don't have the collection of P and Q. So by being able to, by having that, that conjunctive here, I can take down one of those terms and separate it to be by itself. So the idea that P and Q simplifies to Q is, is obvious, as well as P and Q simplifying to P being obvious as well. So by rule two, or sorry, by the rule of, of simplification, I can take this conjunction that I have A and T and simplify to A by itself. All right. So, all right. I get A. 
you can also say you, you have, you know, T as well. Um, but really the idea is you're going to try to get, get terms that actually help you to manipulate the rest of the premises. Separating A out gives me something to work with if I take it up to line 1, for instance. Separating T out really doesn't get me anywhere because there's nothing really to use T with. All right, so in, in similar ways to doing mathematics, where mathematics is a, is a fairly fine science, but it's also a fine art as well in determining what is actually useful for you in a, in a proof. So what we're going to do is we're going to take A, all right, from line 3. We're going to do another line here, all right? So we're going to take A, we're actually going to sub it into line 1. Or, you know, we're going to do some more stuff with it here. Um, so how do I get this to actually sub into line 1? If I put A by itself, really there's not a whole lot that I can do with it because the way that we've got our argument set up as well in that first premise, having both of these things leads us to the conclusion that we want. So how do I get both of these things? Well, I already have the A, which I know for sure comes from line 2. All right, so we had the A and the T, we got for sure our A, because we have A and T, we do have A. But do we have G? Well, I don't know. But remember we have another rule that helps us with this. Go back to our rules of inference. And we have a rule here, all right, this idea of addition. All right, with addition, it meant that if we have one positive item, well, we can have it as a as an addition with any other item here, right? Because it, it doesn't make any difference to the original premise that we started off with. If we have P and then we add a Q, or we have an R or an S, remember we could stick anything on at the end, and it doesn't make it untrue, right? That conclusion, right? It doesn't negate our premise. Our conclusion is perfectly valid that way. And so what we do here is we do that rule of, of addition. So what we do is we take our original A. Try that over here. All right, so A from line 3, we're going to add it to G. All right, so basically what I do is I take 3. All right, from line 3, I'm going to do some addition. All right, so I just simply mark off that I took this line came from line 3, I did some addition. So now that I have A or G by addition, I can now go to my last line where I can say, well, now I have A or G. Well, A or G actually helps me in line 1. So if I take A and G, A or G, sorry, and put it into line 1, well, the implication tells me that I should get S. And so the, the last line here gives me an S. Why? Well, because I took line 4, I put it into line 1, and this was modus ponens. All right, so remember, modus ponens back in our very first original sort of set of of uh, of inferences, rules of inferences, right? I had P and, or sorry, P leads to Q, right? If P, then Q. I have the antecedent condition. It leads me to the consequent Q. And so, therefore, I have a valid argument, and I do get my conclusion of Q, right? Based on this original premise. Going back to a formal deductive proof here for this argument, Right, the initial argument that I had here, right, was if I have A or G, that should lead me to an S. Well, do I have A or G? Well, yeah, back down here in line four is how we got A or G, right, from our addition of from our addition of A, right? We have A or G substituted up into line one that gives us our S. And because we get our S, right, because we get S in the end, that matches what our conclusion was supposed to be, that we get S from these two premises. So is this a valid argument? Of course, right? 
the idea is that if we have either algebra is required, geometry being required, then mathematics students will study mathematics. Well, the second statement said that if algebra is required and trigonometry is required, we would get the result that all students will study mathematics. Well, linguistically, it might be a little bit confusing, hard to sort of tell what leads to what, but very clearly from the formal deductive proof, we see that having these two premises necessarily leads us to that final conclusion of S. Because if we separate out our algebra as a term, if we add it to the you know, uh, geometry that's required, then suddenly we end up with all students studying mathematics. And so this ends up being what we call, and a term that's not unfamiliar to you, a valid argument. And that's formal deductive proof. And we can get much more complicated than just simply, you know, if algebra is required, geometry is required, algebra and trigonometry are required, and so on. Um, but the idea is that even something as simple as this can be broken down into a simpler form of symbolic language. Similarly, if you have a more complex one, you can also do the same sort of proof that you see here. And there you have it a way of actually proving validity using symbols only and some very basic rules of inference.